I think this has been the most confusing chapter so far. I, I don't know how you guys felt about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of hope that in the second part of the chapter, some things will clear up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was interesting. I guess it makes sense, but like the decision to be like, I'm not going to show you how to create, to use like the class. It's more like I'm going to explain how it works. And so it feels like it yeah. might marry with doing some of that kind of more practical stuff. But if you haven't done that practical stuff, um, it probably is that added bit of stuff that you need to learn about. <laughs> are As there ever, others? Are we surviving? Are we all surviving? Surviving, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did uh, did anyone? I didn't check, but I'm guessing not. Did anyone respond suggesting they might do uh, another <laughs> chapter or something? no I'm like what do we do we need to like recruit more people uh, yeah I feel like we've I feel because it felt like there were quite there's quite a lot of like people who came like not every time but who you yeah. would kind of see around and now like the last two or three it's kind of been like okay well it's the three of us now <laughs> <laughs> so so the other guy Sam he said he yeah. wouldn't be here he be offline because he works with me um yeah so I know he's not coming. Um, I don't know. I could just like bully him into doing it again, but <laughs> he was like, I'm not doing this again for a while. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hmm. <laughs> was there another cohort? Because there was some other cohorts that started. Was another one of them one in this time zone or were they all? I US think they're ones? all America's time zones. Yeah. Unless you yeah. like, want to try and merge with a 10 p.m. book club, which just sounds awful to me. <laughs> Just, you know, we'll not be able at that uh, yeah. time of the day yeah. to cross no, it <laughs> Yeah, does not work. Yeah, okay, fine. I was like, if there was one that was like in this kind of rough time zone, then it might be like we could maybe try to eventually merge. But if there's nothing yeah. happening elsewhere, then I guess we can advertise on the, the Our Ladies Slack workspace as well. Yeah, see if also, it, it might be, it kind of feels like we might be at the kind of point at which people might be interested because it's I guess like the thing to stress is that it's not like I mean I think it's probably useful to be doing it cover to cover obviously um but actually like the bit we're doing here is all about you know specifically looking at object-oriented programming and that yeah. that's that interests you then then this is what we're doing so having to necessarily have gone through the stuff about like you know control flow is not like <laughs> A prerequisite necessarily yeah, yeah. Hmm. yeah let's let's try and do some twitter mm. booting so it's not three of us presenting to one another otherwise i'm fine with it yeah i'm fine with it it just makes me feel more like because like today i'll be disappearing and I'm, i yeah. then i feel like more responsible that i should <laughs> uh that, that i'm gonna be like not i'm gonna just leave just two people it feels like so feel silly um, but yeah, happy with the three of us uh, at least. Can we start then? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. That's five minutes. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Cool. So this week, after the great introduction of Megan's uh, last week to object oriented programming, we will um, learn a bit about one um, object oriented uh, object class, I would say. And that's called S3. So just for the introduction, there were some facts about S3. So it is R's first and simplest um, OO system, and it is the only OO system used in the base and stats. It's also the most commonly used system in cron packages, and it's very flexible. And I will go through these three sections today. So the first one is uh, basics, so a rapid overview of all the main components of S3. The second one um, goes a bit more into the details of creating a new S3 class. And um, then 13.4 is about S3 generics and methods. And I thought so it was interesting, sorry to already uh, interrupt, <laughs> but I thought it was quite interesting in the introduction that like 
in the previous chapter or whenever um that you know uh Hadley had kind of written like oh one of the challenges is that there are all these different classes and people have different reasons for using the different ones and it's not necessarily straightforward and in the introduction to this he was pretty opinionated about like you should be using this one unless like there's a really good reason not to uh so I wonder if he's like just trying to like make that a thing or whether that is a commonly accepted thing um because it didn't sound like it was commonly accepted in the previous bit yeah I'm not sure if he's saying that you should really use it he's just stating that it's most like the most commonly used system and maybe it's just because it's also the simplest and first and not so many people actually do the object-oriented programming or it's I don't know if it's so simple then maybe it's just the, the go-to yeah <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, and for some interactive helper functions in this uh, chapter, we are going to use the Sloop library. Okay, so generally speaking, um, we can say that an S3 object is um, or actually consists of a base type and a class attribute, and it can have additional um, attributes. And it always uh, behaves differently from its underlying base type whenever it's passed to a generic function or short generic. And to um, go a bit deeper into what is a generic, um, because for me, it actually was not super clear, but now it's, yeah, makes sense. Um, it's, uh, yeah, depending on the class of an argument to the generic, it uses a different implementation. And you can, uh, for example, use f type to find out of if a function is generic. So I just put here three functions that I um, sometimes use. And now I know that they are, oh, oh no. <laughs> I guess I have to put the, yes. Okay, so print um, structure and summary are all um, generic functions. And um, yeah, another thing about the generic function is that it's um, actually hiding uh, the, the underlying uh, the underlying base type of the object. So for example, if you would um, create a time variable um, that's here uh, with a year, month, and date, and then you ask a uh, structure of this time. It just shows you this is of the uh, class POSIX LT, and it has these two dates in there. But when you check out the attributes, you actually see that it has this class, but it also has a names attribute with these, um, like all those units, I guess, basically. And when you then use unclass and then check out the structure, you see that actually the whole thing is built on top of a list. So a generic uh, function basically hides this, uh, this underlying structure of an uh, object or oh, object. Oh, what is it then? Object oriented object. <laughs> um, yeah, and I just, to make it a bit clearer how uh, this uh, generic function works, I tried to put it in a little picture. So we have a generic function and depending on the class of the argument that we pass to it, it uses different methods. And the way that it is deciding which method to use is called method dispatch. And with the S3 dispatch um, function, we can get more details on the, the method dispatch. So for example, if we have a factor and then we um, want to know what actually the print function does um, when we pass the factor to it, we can use the S3 dispatch and then see um, there's these possibilities that the function is called. So you could either say um, call print factor or print default. And in this case, it's calling the print factor. And I also made a data frame here with three different columns of different um, types. Um, and just as the summary um, of this data frame, you see that all the three columns look different. So um, what it actually does, if you call um, 
S3 dispatch on the different uh, columns. It, it shows you the possibility that uh, summary could use with the different columns. Um, so for the first, it could uh, use character. For the second, uh, double or numeric. And the third would be factor. To be honest, I don't really understand why it's saying here that it's using the default for those two, even though they look pretty different. So um, I don't know if you have any ideas about that. It was, doesn't he mention it later on when he talks about this method dispatch that default is just included at the top of, top of like every stack? Yeah, it's somehow a pseudo class. Yeah. Thing, but um, yeah, I don't really like, I would expect that then if you have a character, you the, the dispatch is choosing the summary character in this case. Um, and not the, the same thing here and here, even though it looks then completely different. But I mean, maybe then it's... Does it like ascend from the top? So we start with like, for example, age, we start with default and then numeric, and then we go more specific to double? Um, yeah, could also be. Could also be that in the default method, um, those, are, those are both somehow included um, with, I don't know, some conditions and just a factor is somehow special. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I will just go on. Go on. Um, so under the hood, the generic is calling um, class specific functions with a special naming scheme. And this is basically you have the name of the generic function, then you have a little dot and then the name of the class. And this is then calling the specific um, method for the class. And um, uh, sometimes it's not really possible to uh, get the, the source code of these um, methods, the S3 methods. And you can use the S3 get method function from the Sloop um, library. And by that, you can also print the source, source code of the, the, these methods. And you know, that already leads me to the first exercise section. I didn't prepare all of the exercises, um, but a couple. And if we have time, time later on, we can go to the rest maybe. So the first exercise here was describe the difference between T test and T data frame. Um, when is each function called? <laughs> so I actually had to look this up. I was super curious. So the T test, right, is like, a really classical stats test to test the difference between two means. <clears throat> and the T stands for hypothesis test. Uh, uh, <laughs> the T statistic is the hypothesis test statistic. Anyway. Um, <laughs> T data frame is like the transpose on the data frame object. And I think there's also like a T dot default. And then T test is, mm -hmm. the, um, is the T test. And then he yeah. said that there's some like historical reasons that means some naming func some things in R which have dots should not have dots, but they do have yeah. dots. Yeah, I think he said that the T test, for example, would be just like to combine two words. So it would be the T statistic and test just combined. Um, and actually it's a, a street generic um, function. Whereas the t dot data frame is like t dot, and then it's the class that is um, with which the t function is called, and this is then um, S three method. So um, I found it a bit in the beginning a bit confusing the differences between them to really realize method is something different to a function, but um, I guess this is the point that might be important to really get the difference that method is really something a generic function chooses a specific method with the method dispatch. And then, yeah, this is something different than a function or it's also a function, but special. <laughs> um, okay, then the second uh, question was make a list of commonly used base R functions that contain dot in their name, but are not S3 method methods. And I just, put a few. Um, so as you said, I, I also read like, um, those are really not ancient, but <laughs> I, 
um, functions that probably predate the S3 um, objects, and that's why they still have the dot in there. So like, data frame is data frame, sysdate, and so on. Um, yeah. And then question number three, what does the S data frame data frame method do? Um, why is it confusing and how could you avoid the confusion in your own code? <laughs> so I guess it's also I'm, again, it's the S data frame method called with a data frame argument. Yeah. And I would say it is confusing. <laughs> as it has uh, twice the data frame in there and um, yeah I don't know if I mean you don't really I think at some point he also wrote that it's you should not actually write the, the method function but um, yeah let the method dispatch be performed by the generic and then not do it to yourself, right? Did he also suggest at this point that like we should stop using dots in names entirely and we should now yeah. switch entirely to using snake case? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, so I just put here like um, what would actually as data frame do if you um, pass a data frame and yeah, those are the two options you can, it could either go to as data frame default or as data frame, data frame. Yeah. Okay, so um, then we come to classes. And here, um, Ali is saying that S3 has no formal definition of a class. To make an object an instance of a class, you simply set the class, the class attribute. And there's two ways. Um, either you can do it in one step with a uh, structure. So the first argument is basically the, the base type. And then you um, tell with structure, um, with the class argument, the name of the class. Or you can first create um, the object, so you say x is a list, and then say class of x is my class. And to determine the class of an object, you can either again use class, or you can use inherits, and then you would also have to pass an argument with the name that you think or want to check if your object has this, um, this class, and it will return either true or false, depending if it's true or false. <laughs> um, a point where um, probably people who already know something about object-oriented programming from other languages might um, feel a bit uh, weird is that S3 has no checks for correctness. Um, this also, I guess this is also a point where it's making it so simple and flexible, but for, for um, people coming from other languages, it might weird that you can do all that stuff. So for example, you can here create a linear model um, which would have the class LM and it looks like this. And you can simply say now, okay, um, I want the class of this model B date, but when you print it then um, it throws you an error um, because somehow yeah, the class doesn't fit then with what you actually have here. And for creating your own class, you should provide a low level constructor, um, which should always be named with new underscore and then the name of the class. And this uh, basically efficiently creates new objects with the correct structure. And you should also have a validator because the um, constructor should be kept quite simple. And in the validator, which should be called validate underscore and then the name of, this, of the class, um, you can include more checks um, so that the, the object has all the correct values. And you can also in, uh, provide a, a helper function, um, which is then just called the name of the class. And this will provide a convenient way for others to create objects of your class. So then we have some short parts for these three um, 
functions that you can provide. So constructors um, should follow these three uh, principles. So they should be called, as I already said, um, new underscore and then the name of the class. They should have one argument for the base object and then one for each attribute. And they should at least, or they should check the type of the base object and of the attributes. And here would be a, a constructor for, or a simple constructor for the diff time class. It's called new diff time. And then the arguments are the base object. So here it's uh, supposed to be a double and the attributes. So it would be um, units in this case. Then there are the checks. So the first check is for the base object. So is it really a double? And otherwise we stop immediately. And the second is if units, so this one is matching um, one of the names of these um, possibilities. And then um, with structure, the, the um, object is um, created. <laughs> so uh, structure again has the, the base object that, um, yeah, and uh, class attribute and then additional attributes like the, the units here. Um, when we use this now, we just get a simple um, object with the class, uh, yeah, time, uh, diff time, and it's telling me the time differences in seconds, for example, here are the time difference um, of 52 weeks. Um, a validator then goes a bit deeper. So if you have more complex classes, uh, for example, like a factor, um, you could have this constructor here where we have an integer and as the base object and then um, levels which should be of a character type. And it's just checking if indeed the, the object is integer and the levels are a character and constructing the, the object. But then, um, for example, this one will not work and this one will also not work. Um, which is why we need the validator and then you also see why it doesn't work. Um, and the validator actually then unclasses the, um, the vector. And I think I just put down here um, to have it a bit more visual what this actually does. So if we have this factor um, and then unclass it, we would have these um, values, one, two, three, four, five, and the attribute levels would be A. And also here, attribute levels would be A. So um, we unclass um, to get the values and we um, use attribute to get the levels. And we stop basically if there's any um, NAs or if there's values that are um, zero or less than zero. And this would be, then in this case, um, the validator would tell us, I have it also done here, um, that all X values must be non-missing or greater than zero. And in the other case, um, we have actually less levels than the maximum of values because here the maximum of values was five and we only have one level and then it's telling us there must be at least as many levels as possible values in X. Hmm. Okay, <clears throat> now we get to the helpers and a helper should always have the same name as the class and finish by calling the constructor and the validator if it exists. It should be, um, or it should um, have carefully crafted error messages tailored towards an end user and have a nice user interface with carefully chosen default values and useful conversions. Um, and basically what a helper could do is to just coerce the values. For example, if we use diff, new diff time um, one to 10 and would throw an error and tell us um, is double is not true because this is integer. And then we could 
uh, write a helper function, which um, basically takes the uh, this input for um, our constructor and just coerces it to a double. And if we then um, and then also call the constructor, if we then call basically the helper function, it coerces to double, calls the constructor, and gives us the um, this S3 or yeah this object. Uh, with the right class and all the values. Okay, <laughs> then we're already at exercises again. <laughs> um, here, the first exercise was write a constructor for data frame objects. What base type is a data frame built on and what attributes does it use? What are the restrictions placed on the individual elements? What about the names? Um, I think we also had already the base type of data frame in the previous chapter, <laughs> but I still had to look it up again. Um, and it is a list and I just did that here. So um, this is like a very, very simple constructor. Um, you would have to pass a list and the two attributes that um, data frame has are actually names and row names. So you would also have to have a character um, for names and a row names argument. And then I'm checking if X is really a list and if names is really a character and creating X with the class data frame names names and row names is not row names. And it works. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. Do you have anything to, to add? <laughs> I'm so, no, you. No. Non unique running. Sorry, I didn't really hear. Are you still there? Ah. Oh, here you are. <laughs> you were gone, I think. <laughs> I didn't really hear what uh, you were do... saying before. Do they, row names have to be unique or can they be uh, repeated? Ah, I think, I guess that's the restriction, yeah. I didn't really check that. Um, but I think it is a restriction in the in the real um, data frame constructor. Because, and I guess also I names have to be syntactically correct. Names, yeah, names have to be syntactically correct. <laughs> mm. Okay, then I move on. <laughs> um, I just prepared uh, question five of this part. Um, read the documentation for utils as Roman. How would you write a constructor for this class? Does it need a validator and what might a helper do? Because actually I really like this uh, function, which is basically taking um, a numeric and turning it into Roman numbers. I didn't know this exists. <laughs> Um, and I didn't write a constructor, but I thought like a validator um, would probably be useful because there's only um, the conversion of values between one and 3,899. Um, and this could be something that you would put into a validator even though um, then I also realized if it's a different number, it's turning it into an A. So maybe this would even be enough that you check that there is no NA uh, values in there. So ah, this is, an, I guess. And I think it's hard for me, at least when I was reading this, same with the factor exercises and I completely skipped over this one somehow. Um, to like understand what you want to put in a constructor and what you want to put in a validator. Yeah, I think right? it, like it, the constructor is 
just really, really simple. Yeah. So just really check the base types and then if there's any additional things to check for, you would put it in the validator. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a bit yeah, confusing. <laughs> Weird function. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially because it goes into 3,899. <laughs> I guess then you would have to um, include L <laughs> afterwards. What? Well, okay. Then, um, uh, this is already the last part. Uh, generics and methods. Um, and just a short reminder. So the job of the S3 generic is to find the right implementation for a class. Um, which is done with the method dispatch. And if we uh, now check um, what is actually mean has um, in its source code, it's just basically function of X and then use method mean. Um, and yeah, he's saying here, creating your own generic is actually quite simple. So you just say my new generic and then function X use method my new generic. Um, I, I didn't quite understand that yet. I hope there's uh, in the further <laughs> parts something that's clearing this up because for me, this was really looking like, yeah, but if I have here my new generic and here is not just a circular or something. <laughs> um, but I guess this my new generic is uh, something different than this and um, he's explaining then later on use method. So in um, method dispatch, he's just saying what does the use method actually do? And what it does is paste uh, the name of the generic, a dot, and then the classes uh, or the class of X. Um, and the default is also always included. Um, so he says uh, some really simple S3 object would be a system date. And you would only have those two possibilities. So print date or print default when you call print on a date. Whereas if you have a matrix um, with numbers, you would have already three. Uh, so matrix integer numeric and plus the default uh, method to call mean of X. And then if you go into even more complicated um, things, you get even more possibilities. Um, he's not really explaining here uh, into depth how or what that means, but he's saying that we will get to that later. <laughs> so I didn't uh, put too much effort into understanding also why we get here a summary and not just some for the functions it was a bit confusing. <laughs> then um, there's, ways to find methods, um, possible methods for generics. Um, and those are the, from the slew package again, the S3 methods generic and S3 method, methods, methods class. And this basically lets you find um, all possible methods for a specific um, generic function. So for example, mean you can use with all of the, these classes and um, yeah, we we'll always get the um, according method then. And you can also ask like, what are actually the possible generic functions that um, I have for uh, the class of ordered and you will get um, all the possible functions here. And uh, for creating methods, he just said there are two twinkles <laughs> that you should take care of, uh, which are first, you should um, only ever write a method if you own the generic or the class. Um, R will allow you to define a method even if you don't, but it is exceedingly bad manners. Instead, work with the author of either the generic or the class to add the method in their code. And a method must have the same arguments as its generic. Um, this is enforced in packages by our CMD check, but it's good practice even if you're not creating a package. Um, yeah, 
Um, then we have some more exercises. <laughs> um, so he, here it was read the source code for T and T test and confirm that T test is an S3 generic and not an S3 method. Um, what happens if you create an object with the class test and call it T with it? Why? Um, this is basically coming again back to the first question, I think, or the first exercise um, that we have. Uh, I just. Um, I just Oh, okay, I have to put that in here. Mm. So I just used the F type um, for T and T test to check um, that they are not um, a method. So you can see it's a generic function and not a method. And um, yeah, actually what happens if you create a, what was it? An object of class test and then run T with it. It still just um, transposes it. And then method is the extension of like print dot data frame. Um, uh, um, what do you mean exactly? I didn't get it. Sorry, so a generic versus a method again, I mm -hmm. somehow have now combined the two in my head. So mm -hmm. the generic itself is print, and then a method is print dot data frame. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, with it now. So both of these are actually um, generics, but if you would uh, have an object that you call test and call it with T, um the method that would be called would be t test but it's not it's not calling the function um t test but then it's calling the method t test and that's why we still get the um transposed vector here and not uh t test of the vector yeah <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> I guess that can lead to confusions. Um, then there was some, I, I thought, quite simple exercises. So I hope I didn't miss anything here. Um, what generics does the table class have methods for? So basically, you can just use this um, sloop as three methods um, class and run it. And then you see all the um, possible generics that you have for this class. I don't know if there's anything to add. I guess it's just to... Um, so uh, these to... are all the different generic functions that we can use on a class without it mm -hmm. being like, I don't know what that is. Okay. Yeah. I guess, or did I, I miss something here with the methods again? What generics does the table class have methods for? No, that just means that you can call this generic dot table, and this would be the method for this generic and table. Yeah. Um, what generics does the ECDF class have methods for? Is I think basically the same. <laughs> So it's a bit pure. And then which base generic um, has the greatest number of defined methods? <laughs> it's probably print, right? Oh no, it's yeah. bracket! <laughs> it's just a gray bracket. <laughs> yeah, I think it was like 64 um, methods. No, 64 generics for this, um, no, wait. 64 methods for this generic. Yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah. 
So um, yeah, I just filtered all the, the uh, functions in the base um, that are generic. And then I mapped it to the S3 methods generic to get the names of the methods for this generic. Um, then I just counted and checked in the names which um, has the max for the number of methods. Yeah. I didn't really think about too much about what, what does it mean then in the end if this has so many methods. I mean, I guess it's it's one of those like, I mean, it's a function that is you can that we learn about in the very first like indexing chapter. So since so you can you, index into anything, I guess. What yeah, you, I you guess anything i guess it makes sense yeah so basically you can you can extract um values from more or less any kind of s3 class yeah um okay i think this is the last um i i think i didn't i i'm already here no uh, i think i didn't really do those anymore those um, exercises so this would be what i prepared so um i don't know do you want to go through any more exercises or are we good actually <laughs> um i mean i'm at least good although i'm gonna have to reread this all again because i'm still not totally yeah yeah, maybe grokking. But also maybe next week if, if you do the second part of the chapter, yeah. things will um make more sense. Yeah. I hope that. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Generics and methods. Yeah. Actually, I like the um the information about generics. Um because I read generics already. Like a couple of times in any like error messages or stuff, but I yeah. never really thought about what does it actually mean. And now it's uh, making a bit more sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Cool. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, yeah. Anne. Thank you <laughs> for being here. <laughs> so, see you next week. Yeah, cool. We did it. <laughs> All right. See you guys next week. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye.